for that. All right. Hey, Pamela. Hi, Fraser. Oh, I forgot my lower third. Who are you? Who is this person? I, I don't even know who you are anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah. so many things to remember. I know, so many things to do. And worry about your roof caving in. Yeah, and your garage flooding. Yeah, I know. I, this is like the, the Monday that nature attacked astronomy cast. I don't want to own a house anymore. I'm just like, I'm done. I'm done owning a house. So if anyone yeah. wants to buy my house, just come grab it. Okay, um, so... Welcome to Astronomy Cast. This is uh, going to be episode 335, where we're going to be talking about the photoelectric effect. Uh, so, all about uh, originally Albert Einstein and how this is what he got his Nobel Prize for, and so on and so forth. So, we'll take about 30 minutes to record the episode, and then we'll stick around for a while after, and we'll answer your questions about space and astronomy. And we've got a captive Pamela this week. Yes. Because you can't leave your house. It's just gross. We got like a quarter inch of ice last night, and campus was closed, and yeah. It's how does gross. ice, how do you get a quarter inch, like what does that, like did it all just fall as ice? So, so what that means is the upper atmospheric temperatures are greater than the lower atmospheric temperatures. So what starts as rain freezes on its way down and you get globules of ice instead of nice fluffy snow hitting the ground where it merges together to form a sheen of death. We don't get that here. <laughs> We just we've never had like I know in in the east like Montreal Toronto they'll get ice storms like that but we don't we don't get that on the west coast and occasionally we'll get last night we got some kind of similar just all snowed and then it all froze and then and now just all of the snow like an inch of snow but it all just was really wet and so it's all turned to this kind of crunchy ice yeah but yeah that's it's, it's got to be horrible. so dangerous. To drive yeah, and, and we it, never yeah. shoveled, so the five inches of snow that we had on the ground, we just kind of mushed down as we needed to. Right. And now it turned into ice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Ice is nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, was there anything you wanted to announce? Anything you wanted to mention? Um, anything yeah, you so, wanted to a thon? Well, I'm going to do that during the live episode. Okay, sure. So, but before the live episode, because it won't matter for the people here this episode next Monday, I'm going to be in Pensacola, Florida this upcoming weekend at Pensacon. And if you're going to be there too, let me know over social media. And we're going to have a booth up on the third floor. It's booth number four. And uh, we'll have all sorts of stuff for you to try, for you to learn, and for you to buy should you care to be an astronomy cast or CosmoQuest wearing person. You should care. You should care. <laughs> Jim Meeker says, we have thunder snow today. Yeah. I don't even know what, I don't even know what that is. Thunder it's, snow. it's where you have a thunderstorm and snow simultaneously. Thunder, lightning, and snow. And uh, Paul Gracie says, 70F here in SoCal where the weather goes to you. die. I Paul, I... Love. Yeah, I'd love to, to <laughs> live in California right now. Um, but it, hey, come May, this place is paradise. No place I'd rather live than than here. Um, okay, we're supposed uh, to have first flowers. We have snow. <laughs> um, you know, if someone goes back through the episodes of Astronomy Cast, I'm sure it's just us complaining about the weather. You know, for six months of every year. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. And then later, we're, we're loving the weather. Uh, so I've enabled the Q&A app. So if you want to ask us any questions, if you want to provide any comments, feedback, whatever, you can totally do that. The other thing is uh, is if you want to make a comment on YouTube, you can do it there. If you want to make a comment on the event page on either the Astronomy Cast or on Google+, Plus, on Twitter, use the hashtag AstronomyCast. Pamela often watches that one. Um, Just we will try at to, me. Yeah, and we will try to catch all these. You can send me an email, my phone number, if you need to call me. No. And, you know, <laughs> we'll try and just patch it all in. So, but yeah, like, like we'll stick around for you know 20 minutes, half an hour after this episode, and answer any questions you have about space and astronomy. Not just what we talked about today, although I'm sure that's going to be bubbling up in your mind, but just anything that's been bothering you or you want to get some more insight into, we uh, we'd be glad to go into it. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, and virtual star party last night. <laughs> Europa Transit Live. That's awesome. And a near-Earth asteroid uh, pass live. 
So that's very cool. Very cool. Um, okay. Well, you let me know when you're ready okay. to record. I am pressing. Re you can you hear the wind? The wind. No. All the windows in our house just started shaking ever so slightly. <laughs> nope. Nope. The okay. fidelity doesn't come through this uh, this hangout. Okay, good. I'm pressing record, and I'm not in mono. It's that Monday. It really <laughs> is that Monday. And I'm pressing record. It's recording. It looks glorious. I am also recording. Also Hi, Preston. fabulous. Hello, Preston. Thanks again for editing our shows. We really appreciate it. Uh, and now enjoy a show. Do you have my the part that I have to read out. Astronomy Cast, episode 335, The Photoelectric Effect. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos. We help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I'm doing well. We're we're having windstorms here that seem to have deeply upset the dogs. So I apologize in advance for the uh, upset interlude in the back. I can hear I can hear some upset dogs. Uh, and, and now you've muted yourself. That's just perfect. <laughs> they, they must be going really crazy. She, you're just nodding. No one can see. She, no one can hear. She's just nodding. They're still going crazy. No, Allow no, me to they fill them. Okay. <laughs> They'll be back. It's it's uh, winter for those of you who are listening to this in the archive, and Fraser and I are having a Monday. Yeah. My roof did bad things that led to several inches of water, mm -hmm. and Fraser's garage. Yeah, my garage flooded. So yeah, but, but we have good things to announce for the future. Yeah, the future will be bright. The future is going to be much better than it is right now. And spring will come. Yeah. Um, so on April 26, 27, we're going to repeat our Hangout-a-thon craziness and do 36 straight hours of science content and fundraising to support CosmoQuest and all of our media programs and all of our science programs and all of our education programs. Uh, we're promoting this uh, well in advance, so you have no excuse for not saving the time to be with us for all 36 hours, or at least for a couple of them. Yeah, no, I mean, we learned a lot of lessons. I know you guys really learned a lot of lessons for what things really flew and what things maybe didn't fly and what things you're going to want to do more of and what things you want to do less of and how to get people involved. So I think it's going to be, hopefully people will see, you know, a whole new version of the Hangout-a-thon. It's going to be fun, and I'm, I'm in, and I'm sure you'll see all of our space friends participating at various points during the uh, during the show, so this is going to be great. And uh, I'm going to start contacting people. So if you haven't heard from me yet, it's because we're recording this in advance. And if you're listening to this live or on YouTube, I haven't actually contacted you yet. Okay, surprise! <laughs> <laughs> you're being volunteered. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's get on with the show. Pop quiz: How did Einstein win his Nobel Prize? Was it for relativity? Nope. Einstein won the Nobel Prize in 1921 for the discovery of the photoelectric effect, how electrons are emitted from atoms when they absorb photons of light. But what is it? Let's find out. Nobel Prize, please. Um, so, so let's go back to the story. And so this is, I mean, if you ask most people, if you tell them Einstein won a Nobel Prize, what do you think it was for? They'd be like, e equals mc squared? But no, photoelectric effect. So what's going on? So, so his very first Nobel Prize uh, was, was this weird thing called the photoelectric effect that doesn't really have anything to do with the whole E equals MC squared gravity bending of light, none of that. What it has to do with instead is the weird realization that scientists had been having for several decades at that point that you could get electrons to be emitted from some sort of a metal surface uh, if you shined the correct color of light on the surface. And this was really confusing because at this point in time we didn't really understand light at all. Or they didn't. I was very much not born yet. Uh, so scientists in general really didn't have any understanding 
of what light was. There were people that thought that it was a wave and so you didn't have discrete particles of light, instead you have this field that is waving through space and if you increase the amount of light then that's just a bigger wave, right? Then we had people that looked at it instead as a bunch of individual particles, but when you looked at it as individual particles, people suddenly couldn't explain, uh, well, a lot of things that had to do with diffraction, with interference effects that seemed to be only related to waves. So this was one of those, huh, how do we explain this moments? Because if it's a wave effect, then you should either be able to send more red light at something, which is more energy, or what's the heck's going on? We're just changing the color to blue ends up causing things to bounce off. So particle or wave, they had to decide. And, and the answer was one no one liked and no one really likes today, and it's both. Right. Um, and so then what was, so you know, they had this idea that, that light moved in waves in some instances and other instances where light acted like particles. And so how does this play into the photoelectric effect though? So it, it was actually when people were looking at the, the theory of black body radiation. They, they were trying to understand why is it that um, as you increase the temperature of something, you don't end up, as you measure the wavelength as a function uh, if, let me start that sentence over. When you turn up the temperature of something, if you make a measurement of how much light is given off at each color, you, you see that it doesn't keep getting brighter and brighter and brighter as you go to longer and longer wavelengths. And as you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths and higher and higher frequencies, this was confusing because at the time, all of the understanding that we had of light was you should end up with this exponential growth, which was called the ultraviolet catastrophe. And people got around, yeah, strange name, but that's what it was called because, well, it was in the ultraviolet, you ended up with this exponential growth that no one could explain. Well, eventually it, it got explained and, and that was a useful thing. So, so the idea was um, you can't really explain light unless you look at it as a bunch of individual particles where individual particles must have at least a certain amount of energy. And as the energy goes up, it goes up discreetly. In so, quanta, for example. In quanta. And so as you look at this quanta, um, the fact that it's quantized, because we like to make up words, um, the fact that it's quantized was what eventually allowed the, the black body curve to settle back down as you got to higher wavelengths. And so what's going on then? So instead of it just, it just the amount of output increasing to infinity and causing the ultraviolet catastrophe. Ultraviolet catastrophe. It's got, uh, like what do we see then? You know, as we're observing the light and it's going through this quantized state, what, what are we seeing? So, so what we see is what's called a black body curve because, again, we're not very original with how we name things. And when you have a low temperature object, you have a black body curve that never gets very bright that uh, as you make a graph of number or intensity of the light coming off at different wavelengths, you see there's a whole lot of photons coming off in the very red, infrared wavelengths. It, it will eventually peak at whatever color of light corresponds to that temperature and then it will drop back down. Cooler objects peak more to the red. As you heat something up more and more and more, as anyone who's ever welded knows, the, the peak color, the color you see with your eye and the peak color that comes off of the object shifts more and more to the blue. Right, so if you were just following our uh, instincts on this, right, I take, an, I take a, you know, a black body and, and don't take responsibility for naming objects that were named before you were born, Pamela. It's really not your <laughs> fault. Um, 
<laughs> so if you take, you know, we're going to take some black ball. We'll take a toaster. We'll put it out in space and we'll heat it up. And it's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. And it's going to start to emit photons. And so the, if you're following your instincts, you'd be like, the toaster heats up and it starts emitting photons of the color of light that matches the temperature that the, that the toaster is. And so we would be expecting to see photons streaming off this toaster that match the temperature that, that it is set. But in, in fact, what we see is we see this curve. We see some of the, the lower energy photons and some of the higher energy photons across this curve that, that is sort of predicted by this, this black body radiation. And, and, and what's neat is the, the hotter and hotter the object gets, the more intense the light coming off of it is. So you end up with a steeper peaked... Uh, black body curve. And so if we push that temperature all the way up to thousands, millions, billions of degrees, we're still seeing lower the energy exact photons same shape of curve. popping off and high energy photons. It's still that same curve. It's just shifted towards the, the shorter wavelengths and the higher energies. And, and it was Planck who figured out this is what you need to do. Gustav Kirchhoff, he's the one who in 1860 came up with the phrase black body to, to describe this phenomenon. It's his fault. You, Not it, your fault. His fault, yes. Okay. <laughs> and then it was Max Planck who eventually came up with a mathematical formula involving a constant that later became Planck's constant that, that describes how all of this works. Now, in coming up with his rule, he realized there's a certain minimum energy, that there's steps in the energy that you go through. Everything's quantized. Now, when Einstein looked at all of this experimental evidence that if you shine light on a surface just right, electrons bounce off, and he looked at Planck's law, he started to think about, well, what does it mean that we have quantized light? Well, you have the wavelength of the light, which defines the energy. So far, so good. But if it's a particle, that wavelength is defining the energy of a specific particle. Now, if you have a wave, the total energy of the wave is going to be the amplitude of the wave, and the, the, it, it all plays in together. But it's, it's not a wave that's hitting the atoms in a surface. It's a bunch of individual particles. So if I shine a bunch of low energy, which means long wavelength, uh, frequency that is very slow, um, when that hits the surface, each individual particle doesn't have a lot of energy in it. Now, I can throw as many of these particles as I want at the surface, and the total energy hitting the surface is going to go up and up and up because I'm hitting it with a bazillion particles. But if I'm an atom, because atoms are mostly empty, the probability that I'm going to get hit by more than one of these things, very, very low. So the atom's just going, oh, I got hit by a very low energy photon. Oh, I just got hit by another very low energy photon. I don't care. This is because the electrons and atoms are also quantized. They're also restricted to specific energy levels. And if you want to move an electron from one energy level to another, you have to hit it with the precise energy required to make that jump. And so if you've got one of these atoms in, this, in our toaster and it gets hit by a, a photon of light, if that photon of light doesn't give enough energy to kick that atom up into a higher state, what happens to the photon? Does it just get absorbed, or does it just get... It just keeps going on with its day. Like there's it just no passes. There's no interaction. There's no interaction. So, yeah. so it, it, it could have gotten absorbed by the atom, but it didn't bring enough to the table, didn't and commit... And it was rejected. And it was rejected, which is kind of... Which is, which is back to that, that wave-particle duality, right? Because you've got this thing. You know, it's like a bullet. It's like you're shooting a bullet at a person, you know, and the bullet just gets to the person's heart and, oh, you know what? It wasn't a killing shot, so it just passes through. <laughs> but if it was a killing shot, then it would kill them, right? Like, that's 
just mind bending. Yes. And and human beings, our brains tend to break a bit when it comes to trying to put all these pieces together. Um, but as as we put all of these pieces together, what we start to realize is, okay, so this starts to have consequences to what I need to do to do bad things to atoms. And in this case, the bad thing we're trying to do is get the electrons to go flying out of the atoms in a surface. Well, it's good if you want electrons, which we do. Electrons are fine, Yeah. but this can actually lead to a problem in other circumstances, but we'll get to that in a bit. Okay. Right, so, so we want to get, you know, we want to do the terrible thing of getting an electron out of an atom. Yes. And so how do we, and how do we need to do this? So what, what we need to do is slowly adjust the wavelength of the light that we're emitting until we match the energy of that wavelength to the energy needed to get an electron to go flying out of a surface. And those are, I'm, I'm assuming, just, you know, follow your, your periodic table of elements, there's math required, and they all match up, right? Like you can exactly. tune the right wavelength, you can hit the right toaster, and you're going to get electrons streaming out of it. And, and what's cool is we see this happening on the surface of the moon where sunlight is capable of creating uh, electrons flying off the surface which lead to charged particles. We see this with uh, a nice friendly slab of metal. If you throw light at it in the correct wavelength, electrons come flying off of it. And the wavelength needed completely correlates to whatever it is you're trying to get the electrons off of. Now what decides the energy level that's required to make that happen? Is it a more massive uh, atom? Is it that it's, it's reflective? What, what causes it's, it? It's the binding energy of the particular electron. So when, when you look at electrons, uh, their binding energy is related to what orbital they're in and how much energy it takes to get them to go from that orbital to being completely released from the atom. This is more fancy quantum mechanics. It's fairly easy to, to calculate for hydrogen. Uh, anything other than hydrogen, it starts to become annoyingly difficult. Um, but the nice thing is that, for instance, if you have a crystalline material, you can often use x-rays to excite the crystalline material and get electrons to come flying out. Uh, with certain metals, it just takes ultraviolet light. And so we can produce free electrons and get a charged surface. So when you remove the electron, you're left with a positive surface. and that's good for a number of things. For instance, if I want to detect light, I can create a photomultiplier tube by making a sensor that at the color of the light that I'm interested in, it will cause electrons to be released, and then I just count those electrons, and I use that as a surrogate for detecting the light. Right. Okay, okay. You don't need to look at the light. You're using it as sort of, it's almost like a, a you know electron microscope, right? Yeah. So okay, so it so let's talk about solar power because I think that's one of the where the rubber hits the road with this with this effect, right? Exactly. So so in in the development of some solar panels, I can't speak for all solar panels. So if there's an exception to this, don't send us emails. Um, what what you end up with is you have a material that when it's hit with sunlight, it is hopefully to a variety of different wavelengths of light, it's sensitive and will end up losing electrons and this causes charge to flow. Now over time the, the materials will degrade because you're removing electrons, you're creating a charged surface, you do have to cycle the electricity all the way through so that they don't stay charged forever otherwise you run out of electrons and it just doesn't work. But this is a way to start the electricity flowing, charge your battery, complete the circuit. Right, and so essentially you are synchronizing the wavelength of sunlight with the material so that you're, you know, as you're trying to find, if you're a materials engineer, you're looking for the right kind of material that's going to be generating the most electrons that's best synchronized with the wavelength of, of sunlight. 
and that if we lived in, for example, we were constantly bathed in x-rays, our solar panels might look like crystals, right? So, so another neat way of using this is actually night vision goggles. And with night vision goggles, what you have are detectors that are sensitive to infrared radiation. And so something like a gallium chip. And when it gets hit with the infrared, it again triggers charge, and suddenly you're seeing in the infrared. Right. And so this is a way that maybe we could see, you know, we talk about like if you could see the sky with X-ray eyes or gamma ray eyes, that, you know, that's what we're doing. For example, like we're getting, you know, if there was a way that you could have some kind of detector that's releasing these electrons and then mapping it, you could see what the world would look like. That's really cool. That's a really neat way to, to look at it. Um, so where, I mean, I think we talked a bit a bit about Einstein. So where, do you th where did Einstein sort of pick up on this, this trail? Where did he sort of figure it out and, and carry the ball? Well, it, as near as we can tell, it, it was a matter of there had been people working on this literally for decades, trying to figure out why it was that when you hit different surfaces with different colors of light, you were able to get an emission. They, they weren't fully clued in on electrons at this point, but initially they were able to figure out that there were negatively charged particles of some sort that came flying off of, of whatever was being illuminated. And people played with this phenomena using a variety of different materials, a variety of different colors of light, and it was mostly experimentalists. Then you see Planck's results in the beginning of quantization, and it seems that it, it was Einstein that basically combined Maxwell's equations for the electromagnetic effect with Planck's concept of quantized light and black body ra radiation and put together all of these pieces to realize what's happening is you have a quanta of light with the precisely right energy to ionize one of these atoms coming along. He just put all of the pieces together and when he published this in 1905 it, it led to a, oh, that explains all of this kind right. of moment. I, I love it that he was, you know, this was during his miracle year, right, when he was working on all kinds of stuff. And this yeah. is, it's almost, it feels like he was, like, not only was he so smart that he could work on relativity, that he was also like, oh, I need to win a Nobel Prize. What's something <laughs> that I can just fix really quickly? Hold on. Okay, here, this one, there. Solves all your problems. No one's going to have a problem with it. Experiments are easy. Nobel Prize, please. Now let's go well, back to the Well, and the experiments were already done. Yeah, so it's just like, here's the answer. I've explained it. Nobel Prize. No one would argue, done. So I, I, just, I love that idea. Like it just, it just takes his level of genius to the next level, right? And, and it was actually Robert Millikan who, in, in 1914, said, okay, I'm going to very precisely verify everything Einstein said and did the, the ultimate set of, dang it, light is a wave and a particle set of experiments. Was that like some of the, um, the interference type experiments? Or, yeah. Um, okay, so now obviously we want to bring all this back to astronomy, and we talked a bit about it. So how do astronomers use the photoelectric effect in, in their work? Well, it's clearly part of all the detectors we use. Um, we have to take it into account, unfortunately, when we're building spacecraft, because one of the problems that we deal with is the sun side of a spacecraft is experiencing the photoelectric effect. Sunlight hits the spacecraft, electrons go flying off, you end up with a negatively charged, you end up with a positively right. charged surface. Right, this which, is a part that we, I guess we didn't mention, is, is yeah. well, you get a positively charged surface and you get momentum kicking that's, off the spacecraft, right? Well, that, that's less of an issue here so much as you end up with the shadowy parts uh, due to the flow of electrons, you end up with them being negatively charged. So shadow is negatively charged, then sunlight positively charged, and that flow of charge can do bad things to very sensitive instruments. So there has to be a lot of care taken to figure out, okay, how do we protect things from these stray charges that will build up on the outsides of our spacecraft? So they have to balance the electrical charge of the whole spacecraft. 
Well, and use lots of insulation. That's at the end right, of the day. Right, for the electronics, right. Yeah, it's you can't get rid of the photoelectric effect. Sunlight hits, you're going to end up with electrons flying off. Yeah. Um, but what you can do is realize that's going to happen and just take extra care to isolate and insulate all of the spacecraft's fragile circuitry. Well, let's talk about the momentum part, too, because that's, that's awesome, right? It's the fact that... <laughs> That in addition to in addition to having to deal with this charge, when mission planners are are you know putting their trajectories for spacecraft, they have to account for the fact that it's going to be in sunlight and it's going to get pushed off of its trajectory because of the sunlight hitting it. And this and so the so that's that's down. not so much the photoelectric effect in general as you actually have light pressure. Right. So this is the, the problem of lighter colored asteroids are going to experience more of a push than darker colored asteroids. Uh, so we can actually, in theory, go out and paint asteroids to move them around, right. which is just humorous. But with the photoelectric effect, you, you have the light hitting the object and getting absorbed. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a transfer of momentum but you have the momentum going this way and then you have little tiny electron flying off this way and the object continuing to move forward but the light pressure is still doing that anyways. Do you think there would be a way that spacecraft could harness this electricity? You know, I mean they, they harness it already with solar panels, right? But I wonder right. if, if there's a way to sort of sap up this extra charge differences that are happening and, and deal with it. It's charge differences is, is one of those things where you can harness it for good in some instances, which is what solar arrays are doing, but at the same time, um, it tends to be an equalizing situation where you can only strip off so much charge from one set of electrons. Um, you can only donate charge so much from another set or strip, strip so many electrons off of atoms, rather. So it's a self-limiting phenomenon. There was an idea for cleaning up uh, space junk that I had heard that I thought was, that sort of, I think, used this, and, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but they would have a spacecraft fly out into places where there's a lot of space junk. It would charge itself negatively or positively, and then it would get close enough to these pieces of debris, which had gotten themselves charged up as well, get to a certain distance, and then it would start to attract the, you know, the positive side of the spacecraft would attract the negative side of the space junk, and the tug could then just move away with these, you know, could change its position with these objects in tow, but not actually have to touch them because, you know, they're going to be tumbling or, or whatever. And so you could, over time, have this tug move around and actually gather up a lot of the objects in the, you know, launch a bunch of them and start to track down and gather up a lot of the space debris without actually having to, to get close enough and try to attach anything or try to grab them or anything. Just, just let the, the difference in, in charge keep the attraction going. So, so the problem with something like that is, is when you say that something's tumbling, that action of tumbling means that you're not going to end up with enough charge building up because as it tumbles, the part of it that's, sorry, dog is deeply offended again. Yeah. They don't like tumbling spacecraft. No, they don't. So, so as, okay, so as, as the object is tumbling, it's constantly getting hit by sunlight and, and so this, doesn't give it a chance to have sufficient charge building up in any one place. Right, right. You're you're um, much better off using magnetism. Hmm. Yeah, I, I will. Uh, I, I'll, I'm gonna. I'm sure we'll be doing more digging into the story because it seemed a pretty fascinating idea to me. But uh, but I just thought I'd add that to the to the queue. Well, good. I think we're I think we're good. Well, thanks a lot, Pamela. My pleasure. We'll talk to you next week. All right. And now we save. Save the world. Save all the things. It's a very gross day. <laughs> no. Okay. All right, and now get rolling with your questions, people. I want tough ones. Tough questions for Pamela. All right. It's intimidating when you do that. I know, isn't it? Tough questions for Pamela. You. All right. <laughs> um, 
I gotta save my I gotta throw my file on the server and then we'll go. Okay. So yeah, post any questions. Uh, post them in the Q and A app in YouTube. Post it over just over on the YouTube site in the Google Plus uh, event page on my personal event page where this is being recorded. Wherever uh, use the hashtag AstronomyCast and we will uh, we will find it. We will find you and your question. All right. I'm checking the Twitters. Okay, good. Just jump in. Okay, so I'm going to start with the Q&A app first. Um, Adley uh, Maderick says, uh, very good virtual star party last night. Uh, agreed. It's a great virtual star party. But I always, I always say that because I just love it. So, um, Adam Synergy asks, uh, is it more difficult or unlikely for a scientist to have a miracle year like Einstein in 1905, or is it inevitable and only a matter of time? It's Good very question. rare. It's so so there's a saying that if you haven't made a great discovery by the age of 40, you're not going to, which means I'm now out of it. Oh. Um and well that's okay cuz who's really going to want to reference the gay effect? Um I wouldn't even want to reference that. Um I would it's totally reference the gay effect. <laughs> um so so when people are young, they often have these um, breakthroughs more easily because they haven't yet been, um, they haven't yet had their creativity dampened. And as you get older, I, I haven't read too many psychological discoveries, but the reality is as you get older, you continue to do great work, but the breakthroughs of X plus Y equals equation that will get me the Nobel Prize, um, those creative breakthroughs tend to be fewer. But isn't um, it a case that right now, I mean, scientists are so specialized into their various fields and they're working on such specific problems. In many cases, they're using a very specific piece of very highly uh, technical experiment. Like they're using the CERN Collider to solve this prediction for whatever, right? It's not just like, oh, you know, I got a whole bunch of problems that I'm working on here. Let me solve this problem. Let me solve that problem. You know, across all these different fields, like it's it, science it a little depends. different today than it was 100 well, years ago. Well, it depends on if you're an experimentalist or a theoretician. I think the experimentalists are uh, confined by the techniques that they're specialized in, whereas theoreticians, in some cases, are able to spread out and do. Uh, a greater variety of things with their skill set. I've seen people go from working on trying to predict uh, the characteristics of the Higgs boson to mathematically modeling the characteristics needed to create synthetic blood. And it's because it's the same form of computational modeling. So if your technique is is a form of computational modeling, you may be able to make breakthroughs that are in a variety of different fields that all require the same modeling skills. Um, if your technique mm, in the experimental yeah. side is something that can get used a variety of different places, like spectroscopy, you may have a number of breakthroughs in a variety of different fields. But you're always limited by what's your technique applicable for, what's your theoretical reasoning applicable for. Right, so I mean I guess the wild card is that we've got the internet and that there are ways that people can collaborate with each other like what we're doing right now. Yeah, that, exactly. That just were never possible. I mean can you imagine if Einstein had access to the internet and could just be like emailing or joining forums or playing World of Warcraft or whatever he would have wanted to do, right? That that there would have been these collaborations that can form and 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 I'm seeing them and I'm sure you're seeing them too where where someone will will interact with another person on a forum somewhere, they'll come together, they'll collaborate. Within a week they'll be suggesting that maybe they work on a paper together, that that the research is coming together in interesting ways yeah. that nobody ever predicted. And so I think it's like what we're looking at now with the internet where you literally have the access to the sum of all humanity on a little device. It's crazy. But but there's Don't another count that out. There's another more frustrating side to that which is Einstein was able to take the time to write long and thoughtful letters. Dirac took the time to write thoughtful letters. Chandrasekhar. All of these men had time. And today what we're finding 
is because of technology, no one has a secretary anymore. We, we are all expected to know everything all of the time. The number and you're of public, in outreach. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the number of publications that are being written every day has gone up hugely. And so I think we're also hampered by modern technology because the time necessary to sit and be thoughtful is something that has to be violently stolen from our day. I, I know I'm trying to get into that, the habit of shutting down email for five or six hours every afternoon and turning off social media mm -hmm. so I can actually accomplish work. And yeah. it's frustrating that in order to do science, we have to reject the internet. Can you imagine like just sitting at a desk, like it's an empty desk with like a pad of paper and some notes and like that's your desk, that's your workspace, you know, like you're just going to write some stuff, some ideas down all day long. No one's going to interrupt you, no one's going to yeah. no one's going to want to play tell you how they got on Flappy Bird. You're just going to you're just going to sit there and puzzle through your equations and No fail blog, no yeah. Tumblr, yeah. no yeah. Uh, yeah, there's so many things that, I mean, we, we both know people that will get on our case if we don't read their blogs, but we don't have time to read their blogs. Yeah. So I, I think, I think I am the optimist and you are the pessimist on this which one. Which is always true. Which is always the case. <laughs> um, I think there are some amazing this, we live in an amazing time. We literally yeah. live in one of the most amazing times that's ever existed in all of humanity. Crazy stuff can happen. So I, I, I do agree with that. I just think right. there's some limiting factors there that there are no limits. <laughs> All right. Um, Josh Andrews asks, are ground based solar panels designed differently to spacefaring ones because of the difference in the spectrum? Or is it too small to worry about? Oh, it's really interesting. Um space based ones are way different because of the environmental effects. On the ground, when you're bil building a solar panel, that sucker has to withstand rain, it has to withstand wind, and so you have this nice thick surface. Um, it's much more robust, much heavier. When you're building solar panels for space, you're building something where it's, it's thinner than paper. And, and so how you build it is fundamentally different based on in space it has to weigh nothing or it costs too much to launch and on Earth it has to withstand the wind and rain. Have you seen the pictures of the International Space Station where like a micrometeorite has gone through the yeah. space station solar panels and it looks like somebody you know, punched a hole in a piece of tinfoil? Yeah, and and, we, and yet when we think of solar panels here on Earth, they're these big glass blocks. Yeah, of, exactly. Yeah, totally. So I, you're exactly right. And so, but I wonder about the spectrum itself. I wonder if that if that changes. I'm sure they consider the spectrum a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So number uh, one billion and one. 100 billion and one asks, how does this charge affect planets, particularly any that always have the same face to their sun? Could you have half a planet positively charged and the shadow side negatively charged? What's really cool is when you look at Mercury in the SOHO imagery, it actually has an ion tail. And this is because the sun-facing side of Mercury is getting various atoms, photoelectric effect, psh, gone. Wow. Yeah. And it's not even tidally locked to the sun. No. But but it does rotate very very slowly. Uh so yeah, you it's and it's not just electrons with the case of mercury. You you see different atomic ions getting radiated away. Yeah. So you could you would assume you've got all these hot jupiters tidally locked to the planet, you would definitely get a a different charge on the planet on the on the side, depending well, on which one. It, it, it's going to depend on rotation rate. It's going to depend on composition. Um, there's there's lots of you you can imagine getting massive winds that just because you have a tidally locked planet, you end up with massive winds that don't allow things to stay put long enough 
for charge to build up. Thomas Tranecker says, try working at a nuclear plant, no social media, and heavily filtered internet and your own room. I'm on sector P4. <laughs> <laughs> sector 7G. Um, now it just sounds like you're playing Battleship. That's where Homer works. Ah. Um, okay, here's a question, not about with the show. Question for Pamela Post Show. I fly from my local airport in a small aircraft with my friend. Oh, this comes from Rod Mole, by the way. Uh, we see small rainbows, but they're in perfect circles. Explain this. It's, it's uh, yeah, that's what I've seen those while flying too. That's really one of those cool things. And you can actually generate these um, with just the right shaped fountain or sprinkler. What's happening is as the sunlight passes through the mist of rain, it gets bent. And how much it gets bent depends on the exact color. It gets bent out. And because you're able to see all the way around where the bend is occurring, you're able to see this perfect circle. And now is that because you're, you're up, you're at altitude, and so you're seeing sort of below the horizon that you would... It's, it's, it, it has to do with uh, just the fact that you're dealing with mist, and it's the mist, not rain at that point, that's causing the bend. Uh, this, I've seen it most when the sun is lower on the horizon, below the wing on the horizon, and as it comes up through the clouds, that's when I see the rainbows. Right, because normally, like, when you see a rainbow, it is just the opposite side of the sky, so, like, we're to the sun, right? And so, and you'll get it when the sun is, you know, it's late afternoon, the sun's really low in the sky, and then there's a rainstorm on the other side, and then you're going to get the sunlight going through, the raindrops bouncing off them back, and you get that rainbow, you would see the whole thing, but the rest of the whole thing is... Is below, below the, the is below the horizon, but when you're in an airplane, you're up above, and you're getting kind of a peek around the the corner of the Earth. So that's just me guessing. Uh, Robert Preston asks: Where photons are emitted from an object, can the object ever run out of photons? It'll just stop having photons of wavelengths. And it won't run out of photons, it's electrons in this case. It right. won't run out of electrons, it will simply stop having electrons with appropriate energies to be ionized away. Right, but if you hit it with gamma radiation... You're just, just going to yeah. strip everything off. And yes, it will run out of electrons. <laughs> right, right, and it has run out of everything. Um... Okay, Adley Medarek says, uh, does the photoelectric effect have anything to do with a cracking dashboard on a car or the fading color on a couch sitting in the sun? Or am I completely no, left field here? No, that's, that's actually chemical de uh, degradation. Right. So the energy of the sun is causing a chemical reaction in the dashboard or the couch that's causing the color and yeah. the, de the wear and tear on the, on the thing. Yeah. Yeah. And often it's also the oxygen in the air with the dashboard. So it's a combination of heat and oxygen. Uh, Will Selwood notes, ultraviolet catastrophe, ablation cascade, quantum mechanics, science gets all the best names. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Nancy Graziano says, does the black body curve tend to be a bell curve? It's like a bell that someone whacked the side of. It's, it's asymmetric. Right. Um, and Nancy also notes, I hope you do Cards Against Astronomy again. We're, we're in the process of putting together a game site, and that will be part of it. Perfect. That's the great thing about Cards Against Humanity is you can, uh, you can modify it. it. Yeah. yeah. If anybody has never played Cards Against Humanity... Don't do it with children. Don't do it. Do not play the game with children. Do not play it with coworkers. It is not. You yeah. Will, you you cross every line. You will learn. This game. You will learn things that you will go to dark places that you may never I, be able I've to I've had to Google from. words that I wished I hadn't Googled afterwards. <laughs> um, let's see. All right. Let's see what else we got. So I've sort of pulled all the questions. Uh out of the QA app. If anyone's got one, let me know. Uh, let me see if I've got any more. Is there anything on Twitter? No. No? Okay. Um, 
So over on YouTube, uh, Wyatt Kayer asked, how can something exist in two different states at the same time in order to work with the theory of relativity? I guess Wyatt is talking about ent quantum entanglement? So things aren't in two states at once. Are are you referring to something? Oh, about, being... no, about, about particle and, and yeah, wave, oh, and, wave so, and particle. Oh, so so uh, one of the things about wave particle duality is you can never observe something simultaneously as a wave and a particle. You either observe its wave nature or its particle nature, which is one of those things that caused science scientists no end of heartbreak. Right. So, I mean, you know, we talk about it now, like trying to explain it, but just imagine these poor scientists going through it. And this, this is really quantum mechanics more than relativity here. Yeah, yeah. So it's a quantum mechanics thing. But it's, it's just the way the universe works. Like, how is this possible? It no. is. It just is. We don't have to like it. We just have to live with it. Um... Let's see. Anything on Google Plus? Not that I see. Anything on the other Google Plus? Um, so Hel oh, Helg Bjorhaug. I hope I did that okay. Is it Helg Bjorhaug? <laughs> he's he's one of our our one of, correspond he's a great person. Great name, yeah. I have no clue how to pronounce it either. And a great I sort sponsor of, yeah. to everything we've been doing and uh, yeah. Um, but he says tyranny of the moment, fast and slow time. In the Information Age by Thomas Highland Erickson is a great book and provides a link. So uh, I will that read it. That go in the show notes. Bjorhaug? Bjorghaug? Bjorkhaug? Anyway, please let me know. I'm, I know you will. Um, let's see. Anything else? Not over here. Mm, okay, so, oh no. Um... I got nothing there. I think I'm all out. Nothing on Twitter. Okay. okay. No. Nope. Well, I think we're good. Let me just see if anything else came up in the QA app. Feels nice to get through all of the questions. If you ask a question, if you want to have a PhD astrophysicist answer your questions about space and astronomy, one is here. Uh, I, a Zoken Mayan god says, why haven't humans been able to it, utilize this principle to take advantage of the behemoth ball of plasma? We know is the sun. Is there chemical limitations? Physical? We do, right? That's yeah. solar power. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I it's... wonder if it's like wondering about the chemical, like about it. Yeah, that rotting. I don't know. Yeah. But as a heads up, next week's show is not going to be recorded at a normal time because I will be on my way to an airport. Um, so Fraser okay. and I will figure out when to record. Yeah. And we haven't done that yet, but we yeah. will let you know. So watch the hangout. Yeah, my Monday mornings are pretty crazy, so it might have to be pretty early. So, or it um, might be Thursday. We'll sort. We okay. have it yet. Yeah, yeah, we'll sort. <laughs> uh, or Sunday. All right. I'll okay. be at Penn. We'll figure it out. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, thanks, Pamela, as always, for providing your deep knowledge. Thanks to all of the fans for for watching. We really appreciate it. Uh, what's coming up next? Next is Learning Space on Wednesday at. A new time. They're switching to a new time to make it more convenient to people in Europe. Watch CosmoQuest for the Hangout event. Great. And then Friday, the Weekly Space Hangout. Uh, last week, Nicole Gallucci handled it, which was great. And Amy Mainzer from NASA showed up. And uh, I'm sorry I missed that. And uh, But I'll be back uh, hosting it again on Friday. So, uh, so definitely show up for that. Okay. Well, hey, thanks, everyone, for watching. And we'll see you all next week. <laughs>